Welcome to my humble abode, darlings. Come in out of the rain and get comfortable. I have a story to tell you, and I hope you enjoy. If you do, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. The Hunt by David Morningway The mist rolled through the fields of fading green like silent waves on a forgotten ocean. Giving the autumn pathways of the local park even more eerie settling. Within the dawn's early hours, in the Smoky Mountains, if one got up early enough on the right morning, it was almost like getting to jog through Silent Hill. Like the stepping foot into another world before the sun would rise and chase the fog away. Like a shepherd scaring off the wolves so the herd could walk along safely. None of the other sheep saw me follow her. Obscured by forest and mixed, I followed the woman's scent from the woodline of her apartment complex, which is only about a mile away, all the way to the park's entrance, which borders the local college. The convenient setup has delivered me several victims so far, most of which are naive young college students, just like little Jennifer here, who is now about a half a mile into her morning jog before class. I've been watching her for almost a fortnight now, and must wait until she hits the one-mile mark before I move on her. For one mile, she reaches the peak performance level, and she will need every ounce of her strength if she is to survive. My presence, and she must have somewhat of a chance. If the hunt is to be enjoyed, if there's not a chance for her to escape, then it's not a hunt, but simply killing and that is not enough, not for such graceful and beautiful prey. She's only about 500 yards away now, cutting through the mist, like a sentient blade with her perfect form and relentless speed. I begin to slowly unfurl myself from the image of man, breaking and reforming my bones and tendons as the facade of humanity melts away with the pink flesh around my rapidly expanding skeleton. Although she has earbuds in playing loud pop music, I try to slow my transformation, so the sound of snapping marrow and ripping muscle won't alert her to my close proximity, which she inches closer to every second. As my metamorphosis becomes complete, so does the gap between us. As she reaches a parallel position to me, within the forest I see the very first telltale signs of her brain, recognizing something is wrong, recognizing me, as her nostrils begin sniffing the air, no doubt smelling my sweet and lovely sulfuric rot. I know she has smelled me prior to this morning, but probably justified it within her mind as the decay of a natural forest animal. However, I'm about as unnatural as a creature can be in this world, at least on this side of the veil. <clears throat> I know she's felt my presence, too, for each time she runs, the number of times she looks back and around becomes more and more prevalent. Her head has been on a swivel the entire mile to me, frantically scanning for the threat that she is running directly into. You should have stayed back in the barn with the rest of the little lambs, girl. But you're not a sheep at all, are you? <laughs> no, you are something a bit more. Something courageous. Something restless and fast. Something delicious. The sheep all freeze in place, all lie down for the slaughter, with pleading cries. But you will be different. You will run away with practice skilled. Fueled by desperate adrenaline, I can no longer hold back, no longer need to ask as I take my heavy step towards you from out of the woods. The fog thick with your sweat and fear, your scent parting up my nostril as the mists part around my advancing figure as I move slowly towards you with strained patience. Before you take in my full horrific visage through the fog, you fulfill my greatest desire and run like you've never run before. Ah, oh, thank you, Jennifer. 
I promise not to make you wait long. As she sprints off at a speed superior to most of her kind, I jump onto the gravel path and begin my pursuit, forcing myself to go slow before I can no longer take the manic excitement and begin to charging after her. She tries cutting through the field to make a shortcut towards the parking lot. But I knew she would, for I have planned this extensively and began turning through the field even before her. By the time she realizes her mistake, it was already too late. As she glances back, I was already reaching the pinnacle of my jump and pounced upon her before she could even consider a course of correction as my jaw unhinged for the first exquisite taste. I thank her for her to return a fiery F you at me before I begin, a fighter down to her very last moments. Fighters oh, always taste the best. The dream woke me at precisely 3.33 a.m., as they always do, making me spring up out of bed so instantly that it almost felt violent as my breath pants, strong with still lingering adrenaline and sweat pours heavily, with slowly fading excitement and fear, as the implications of the dream ease into my consciousness. So does a smile, gently warming its way up my face like a welcome sunrise. It had been growing quite bored, waiting for my next vision of the hunt, waiting for my next wayward victim to track down. As I rise out of bed to relieve my bladder, I stop and stare at the silver crucifix that was gifted to me years prior, gently rubbing my thumb and index finger around the circular band that surrounds the crucifix, right where the two crosses intersect. For several minutes I became lost in this act, circling my thumb around the silver band as the warm, subtle vibrations of the powerfully blessed precious metal calm the storm within my mind. The concealed energy within it creates goosebumps that shoot up my arm and ascend through my spine like a charged battery flowing through a circuit board. I stop and wonder just how many times this special amulet has hidden my true presence for my prey and that had a small bout of laughter at all the previous memories of the hunt. I release the silver amulet as it gently slaps against the tall mirror it hung on, making me take notice of myself. The dark sky blue that usually fills up my irises is glowing a fierce yellow, but that always happens when I have a premonition. The dream drawing out the power within me, regardless of my level of control over it. I breathe in and out deeply as a vibrant yellow dulls, then transitions back to blue. How excited I am to find you, Jennifer. How truly happy I am to once again be the hunter. Don't worry. <laughs> I promise not to make you wait long. I sigh deeply as the alarm snooze functions on my cell phone. Issues out loudly for the third time. My parents never allow me to sleep past the third sound of my alarm's five-minute snooze delay, and it was a habit I kept through all three years of college so far. F, I say in a half-mumbled tone as the hazy fog of sleep refuses to dissipate from my now waking but still clouded mind. Although I had been doing fairly well at switching out of my morning caffeine for ginger and turmeric tonic, I have a full class schedule and need to get some cardio in after I do some pull-ups and push-ups, so I'm definitely going to have to approve some br fresh brewed coffee, and quite immediately. A lot of my classmates are prescribed Adderall, or even use meth to enhance their motivation for such obstacles, and I would be lying if I said I had never tried to do the same before, unfortunately. About three-quarters of the way through my freshman year, I became overwhelmed, overworked, hyper-anxious, depressed, spiritually lost, and pretty much any other negative side effect this world can throw at us at the hardest of times. And this unwanted blend of hopeless emotions led me to make some less-than-logical or safe life decisions. Fortunately, things like speed, alcohol, 
and most other drugs have ended up having adverse or unpleasant effects on me, with the actual enjoyment of the substance being outweighed by the horrid after-effects, with the gravity of a planet. The ratio of enjoyment compared to then feeling like rotten death after partaking was never even close to bringing balance. With the latter, I was being far superior for me, and thus not being fun or worth it at all, although I didn't want to be able to enjoy doing such obviously self-destructive acts, it was still annoying seeing how others could sometimes functionally use this for their benefit while I had to fight tooth and nail with every ounce of my energy and willpower to even try to succeed. This is a blessing, Jen, I remind myself, and thought of how these substances had turned my cousin Charlotte into the walking dead of how she was a track star and a piano progeny. And now she sells her body and robs storage units for drugs. Although the memory of my cousin's de-evolution in life saddens me deeply, the perspective shift of my own situation hardens my resolve and wills me to grab my running shoes as the coffee maker hisses and splutters its usual symphony, signaling that the last remnants of my morning brew are now ready for consumption. After a few sips of coffee, I chug some branch chain amino acid and start my pre-run push-ups and pull-ups before I start thinking about my life too long and therefore lose motivation. After about a half hour, I complete my strength training and head out of my front door into the park. The only inner debate I have left at this point is music, motivational speech, or horror story to feel my run with. I decided... On a story, after noticing that my favorite YouTube narrator uploaded a new 48-minute story with an interesting title, something about the Olympic Mountains, and since I've wanted to move to Port Angeles, ever since I watched Twilight as a little girl, I select part one and begin my morning run with a bit more enthusiasm now. It takes about a half a mile of steady jogging before my anxiety begins transitioning into endorphins and a full mile until I get my prime stride, making my arms and legs pump back and forth methodically, like mechanical pristons, as I become more driven machine than tenacious woman at this point. I lose myself in the horror story, as the narrator's deep voice lulls me along. The thick morning mist accents the suspenseful tale like ketchup on hot, crisp french fries, Oh, God, I laugh out loud at myself. I must really be getting hungry if even my inner monologue is dominated by food metaphors now. I quickly look behind myself, doing a 360 turning spin so as to not fully break my stride while glancing back. And this is not the first time I've done this today. Why, I even actually do that. I ask myself honestly and genuinely, have to think about it before I'm completely honest with myself. I was scared. Why, though, I asked myself. Nobody was there at that time, or the other two times. I've listened to creepy pastas and other scary stories while doing night runs, so this little morning jog should be nothing. You know that feeling you sometimes get in the middle of the night? That feeling you're being watched in the darkness by something. Then the feeling gets so unignorable that it forces you to get up and turn the lights on. But not too quickly, though, because you don't want to let it know that you know it's there, whatever it is. That feeling has been growing inside of me like a virus ever since I left the apartment, and save for the coverage of the rolling fog, all the lights in the world were expanding within the early morning sun, so there was nothing left to turn on, no switch that could be flipped to make the feeling go away or fear subside. I tried using logic to scrape off the creeping dead that was ascending inside of me. I tried telling myself that half a cup of coffee I drank was playing on my already frayed and anxious nerves. Just as I thought, this process was beginning to work, until my dread swiftly and unforgivingly evolved into pure panic as I began to smell rotten eggs and dead animals. It was like the smell was making my brain jump into fight-or-flight mode, 
which makes no sense because I've grown up in the mountains around bears. Dead forest life and even a mountain lion once briefly. Lucky for my brain, I'm literally already jogging. So I just follow my instincts and run the rest of the trail as I had planned anyway. However, instead of jogging back to my apartment the way I came, I just take the roundabout way through town after getting a Gatorade. My once framed nerves calm down a bit and my rehydration is complete. I jog on the road back to my apartment for the last mile. I think tomorrow I'm going to take my bear mace. It's kind of big and clunky, but if it will stop a grizzly, then it should handle anything out there. <laughs> there I go, giving my fears away to nothing but the ether again, nothing but imagination and empty radio waves. Sorry, I'm studying the effects of frequency and vibration upon living biology. Well, I want to study that, it is. After my basic credits are out of the way, I can transfer to a more prestigious university with a better science department, seeing as I turned the horror off. As needless panicking, I suppose I'll finish now on the way back to my apartment. I guess I've become a bit sensitive to caffeine after taking weeks off and make the preempted decision to switch back to ginger and turmeric tomorrow morning. I mean, it had to have just been the coffee working on the bad nerves. That's all I tell myself, unconvincingly. Okay, it wasn't the caffeine. It's been an entire 24 hours since yesterday's incident, and the exact thing happened on my run this morning. I began listening to part two of the story I began the day prior, but after having to restart it a fifth time due to my now wandering mind and paranoia, I simply gave up and opted to listen to the awakening sounds of nature instead. It seemed to start working for a short time, with the early morning birds flushing off my unease with their sing-song melodies. Yeah, it was working, right after the smell came back at a completely different location than yesterday, eliminating the possibility that I was just smelling the same dead animal twice. With the arrival of the horrid spell came the departure of every single sound of forest life, like a switch was flipped within the primal core of nature, life on, life off. And it happened so fast that the length of time it actually took seemed immeasurable. I stopped jogging completely now and held my bear mace out as if something would violently erupt from the woods and give frantic chase after me. I was terrified of the unknown, or did my instincts actually know something was out there and was desperately trying to scream at me that I am very much in real danger? I ran the west of the way in a cautious slow jog. My head turned back at random places whenever my nerves deemed it necessary. I walked all the way back through town with the most recent incident overwhelming my train of thought. What the F is going on, I think to myself, like a desperate detective without a lead. All I know for sure is that if I am going to keep running, then I'm going to need something better than just bear mace. She is definitely the one, I say to myself, as the young woman jogs by, seemingly oblivious to my presence, let alone my true nature or what profound danger she is truly in. She does a quick spin turn whilst jogging, doing a fast check to see if anybody is behind her. She shouldn't have picked up the scent yet. Perhaps this one is a bit more tuned in for picking up paranormal or supernatural presences. Perhaps this one is special and more sensitive to feeling life forms from beyond the veil. And no doubt much more. As I see her nose twitch up and down as she squints her face, her aura changes, signaling to me that fear and anxiety are now bubbling to her surface. She just now picked up the scent, confirming my suspicions. For a force deep within her genetics, her very soul alerted her to otherworldly danger. Before she even smelt the repugnant decaying rot that now permeates the air. The next morning, she returned seemingly both more aware and prepared to the 
paved gravel and grassy trails of the Greenway Park. She is obviously more alert now, looking around randomly and unprompted at the misty forest scenery as she is being stalked. She stops completely this time and holds out a can of bear mace like a pistol, feverishly looking around in fearful anticipation of some attack. She is definitely sensitive. I step back a bit, letting myself take the big picture. As I rub my silver crucifix with my thumb and index finger, making myself focus entirely so things don't play out too prematurely. She takes the public path back to her apartment through town, as she did the day prior, and I follow her closely from the sanctity of the forest the entire way. Since you don't have a concealed carry permit, you'll have to wear the holster weapon outside of any clothing so it's not illegal, the pawn shop employee tells me in a thick southern accent. Though I, too, was raised in western North Carolina, my father trained himself not to have an accent after getting into real estate and dealing with rich, out-of-state clients. And my mother is from Huntington Beach, California, so I never really grew up with a southern twang like the vast majority of my friends. So is it legal to jog the Greenway Park with this thing flashing on my hip? I asked the employee replying to his prior statement. Well, you'll most definitely get some sour or alarmed looks, maybe even a Karen or two giving you a how-dare-you speech. But you just ignore them. There aren't any signs prohibiting it. So you're 100% in your constitutional rights, and there's nothing them or the corrupt boys in blue can do about it, he says to me, more enthusiastically as he turns his hip and lightly taps the absolute cannon of a revolver he has on display. The boyish grin leaves his face shortly after, now being replaced by a look of cautionary hidden fear as he looks intensely into my eyes. A young girl like you should find a nice safe gym to go jog in. The Greenway isn't always safe, especially for college students right now, he tells me with genuine concern in his now lowered voice. How do you know I'm a student, and what are you implying by it's dangerous? right now, I ask with subtle panic in my voice. I saw your college ID when you paid for the weapon. Plus, I had to run a mandated background check during the three-day waiting period for approval. He says matter-of-factly. I apologize to the man, letting him know that I've been a bit on edge and jumpy lately. Listening, he says in an almost whisper as he leans across the glass counter, and looks around carefully for any eavesdroppers before he begins. Have you experienced anything weird out there? He asks. Have you noticed anyone following you? Or just anything at all that would be reason for concern? He concludes. Yes, I say without even thinking. Um, I mean it's nothing. I'm probably just being paranoid. Is it like you're being followed? Or smell something foul at the same time. All the forest critters go dead quiet? He asks, even more hushed now. Yes, I answered in an alarmed whisper. Have you experienced it too? What the hell is up with that? The man paused for a long moment, seeming to have some sort of inner conflict. The kind of decisional turmoil someone has when they're keeping a secret that morally tears them apart. The man stays like this for a short time, before he finally exhaled loudly and looked into my eyes. For the past six months, the township has found two dead college students, killed by unidentified predators. Yeah, Missy Martin and James Caldwell, I say, interrupting the man with my pre-existing knowledge. They found him up by Albert's Mountain, close to the abandoned fire watch. I think the paper said it was a bear attack or something? No, the man yells before quickly composing himself and once again lowers his voice. He looks out the door to see if any customers are about to come in before he continues. The bodies were found ripped to pieces just off the side trails of the Greenway. They moved him up to Albert's Mountain because it's a posted bear sanctuary and the town didn't want to lose the presence of the tourists that pour into Greenway Park daily. 
not to mention the park borders, the brand new golf course, so they didn't want members going elsewhere, let alone lose more business the rich folks' pristine country clubs up in Highlands. The man started rubbing his face in the palms of his hand while sighing, a kind of gesture someone does when they are extremely tired or stressed out. Before letting go of his head and staring downward, like he was almost ashamed of something. I was there, you see, he began. They sought out volunteers, locals to help move the evidence and to not ask too many questions. The town even donated money to my shop. I guess so I'd keep my mouth shut, and I intended to do, too. Told myself that it was the right thing to do. How would we all catch the beast responsible and keep money flowing into the town with our silence? so we could all take care of our families. It's funny, the things you can compromise to do with a good enough excuse. How can you convince yourself that you're doing the right thing in the end? The man said, shaking his head, still not able to reestablish eye contact with me. Here we are, though. No creature or predator caught in over six months. No leads, and now you are coming in here like this. Can't avoid it now. No room for compromise left in my soul. Just what needs to be done. What I should have done all along. I can't have yours or anyone else's blood on my hands again. Locals know something's fishy anyway. I mean, yeah, sure, Albert's Mountain is a black bear sanctuary. But in all my 58 years, not one person has been attacked up there. And now two kids in three months? I don't think so. People just don't want to think about the implications of all of this. So they pretend it's all right. Because the second they question it fully is the second things become real. And my dear, ignorance sometimes truly is bliss. Wait right here, he says, before walking into the back rooms of the store where they kept pond and private goods. After about three or four minutes of hearing loud shuffling sounds, and the tinkling of metal, the man reappeared holding a bulky yet compact revolver and a Walmart grocery bag full of small, heavy boxes. That 9 millimeter Beretta is a very good weapon. Hell, it's what our military uses, but it's not quite enough for bears, let alone anything bigger or potentially more dangerous, the man said. This here is a three fifty seven snub nose and it packs a far greater punch than the Beretta. Plus, I replaced the standard rounds you wanted with high grain instead, giving it a more destructive power. I can't afford to, but the man cuts me off with a wave of his hands and a half smile. It's on the house, he says while handing everything to me. One more thing, he says, before I can even properly thank him. Here he states, as he puts the revolver, Auto loader down on the counter, already loaded with shiny chrome looking bullets. I had a few of these babies custom made for me by a friend after the first cover up. Even then, we knew something wasn't right. The teeth and claw marks didn't make any logical sense. I mean, they were canine, we knew that much. But the size and specific shape was impossible. The only scientific explanation was some sort of mutated dire wolf, if that managed to stay hidden throughout the ages, or an actual effing cryptid, although this idea was met with mockery when I brought it up, so there was no denying something unknown and extremely lethal was killing people without leaving a trace of evidence. Right smack in the middle of the local park. My friend, who also helped volunteer that day, didn't fully believe me, but couldn't fully deny it either. So we made up these special rounds in case the impossible was, well, possible. They're silver-tipped, he says, answering the look of growing confusion displayed upon my face. I don't know what the hell is out there, but just maybe these will help, he says, before wishing me luck as I exit the shop. I glance back into the store window before I getting into my car. I can see the man praying now with his head bowed, closed eyes directed downward in a tightly clasped hands as he nervously muttered something I cannot hear. What the F is going on in this town? 
I say to myself as I turn the ignition and start backing up, reluctantly trying to focus on my biology class in 20 minutes, instead of the impossible wilderness horror that is slowly encroaching upon my life. My doubts towards the man's story, or more specifically my doubts that he's just messing with me, are snuffed out like water on a blazing campfire as I look up the value of what he just gave to me, easily over $1,000 for the weapon and ammunition, not to mention the sterling silver bullets and auto loader. Whatever the truth is, he completely believes what he's saying, making me acknowledge it as fact even more than I already had. None of this can actually be true, though. I mean, this isn't a story. This is real life, where the only demons are depraved and diabolical humans, or maybe even large corporations that have corrupted the nation until we were dubbed corporate America, but not literal monsters of fang and claw. Is this some sort of elaborate, untasteful pre-Halloween prank? I mean, it is the month of October, but this town is more of we tolerate Halloween than actively promote it, let alone embracing the holiday to the point of the residents acting out a collaborative unified plot that borders on sheer cruelty. Either way, it was becoming evident that something was most definitely wrong. Things are not progressing as they should, not following the natural order of events dictated by my premonition which is unheard of for me. Instead of the dream following the predetermined nature sequel of events, like the concrete, unwavering order of the universe, it's playing out more like a suggestion that can now be influenced by unknown elements outside of the realm of my control. Even act independently despite the shackles of our predetermined fate, there remains no doubt in my mind that she is very special. If she was born across the veil, she would most likely be a powerful force to be reckoned with by now. Her latent psychic potential has actually allowed her to alter the pre-existing timeline and therefore mold the nature of the course of events, of reality herself to her will. I doubt she even realized that she's doing so with her subconscious mind's primal defense mechanism tapping into her latent yet powerful potential. I'm going to have to watch her every second now to ensure she doesn't accidentally draw in other forces to foolishly come to her aid. They will all just get in the way. They won't understand what's truly happening. <laughs> they can't comprehend the implications of my mere presence here, let alone the universal need and overwhelming desire to hunt my prey to end their foul and corruptive existence from the earth forever. As I watch the beginning of the rising sun, with futile effort trying to cut through the early morning fog like a spotlight in a hurricane, I stared curiously at myself in the mirror, hardly recognizing the battle maiden that gazed back into my emerald green eyes. I couldn't get back to sleep after a nightmare woke me up at 3.35 a.m., a vision of a pale, humanoid hellhound of impossible height, and a handsome man with one blue eye and the other, a glowing intense shade of yellow. So capitalizing on my coursing adrenaline, I went ahead and did my morning push-ups and pull-ups before donning the tactical gear I bought from the army surplus store the day after I visited the local pawn shop. I still can't get the employee's face out of my mind. With the 9 millimeter strapped to my right hip, the three fifty seven holstered under my left armpit, tactical combat knives fastened on my left chest, and right boot, mace in my cargo pocket, and a Bill Grills parang machete on my back. I look like I'm about to go jogging through hell itself. <laughs> I know there's something unholy and hungry awaiting me on my run this morning because something has already killed at least two people and has methodically been stalking me for over a week. So why go at all? You may be asking yourself. And it's a very good question. K.A., as Roland the Gunslinger from the Dark Tower series would say, which loosely translates to my destiny. 
All I know for certain is that I'm supposed to go out there this morning. An undeniable and powerful force has been pushing and steering me ever since I first became aware of the anomaly within Grinway Park. And although it strongly warns me of danger, it even more tenaciously alerts my soul to something else. Something far greater and more deeply interwoven within my own personal fate. I've never felt anything like the aura of otherworldly power that has been slowly growing inside of me, ebbing and flowing with profound, discharged energy, like a supercell storm, trying desperately to break free of its nimbostratus prison. I felt the manic balance of fear and excitement as I walked slowly to my front door, both preparing myself and embracing the feeling as I marched towards war, and all the glory and horror that came with it. I felt powerful, alive, and supremely driven in a way I have never before, like I've been living a half-life of quiet desperation, to then be awoken by a universe itself, so it could reveal to me my true identity. That's what it feels like, you see. Like the old djinn had ceased to exist, had burned to ash within the asylum of her own problems and hateful turmoil, for a phoenix to then rise in her place, like becoming the paragon of what you are or ever could be. All I know for certain is that something powerful cries out to me, specifically with esoteric purpose, and I intend to answer that clarion call. I will go on this hunt. Cover your weapons as to not alert it to your potential, I heard a voice say, as it eased its way into my mind like a suggestive thought that gained more life and awareness with its every word. The voice was right. My chances of success will increase the more vulnerable I intentionally appear. I grabbed a dark green hooded raincoat from my closet, one that went down past my knees so it would fully cover my weapons, and then downloaded a specific rife frequency to my phone. You see, ever since I had developed the psychic inclination that my foe was inherently canine, I thought to capitalize on a potential weakness. When I first started college, the stress and anxiety, well, blocked me up. After chugging a double dose of Miralax, I stumbled upon the rife frequency for constipation and thought to give it a try. The sound was annoyingly invasive, to say the very least like a digitized version of nails scraping on a chalkboard. If you don't know what I'm referring to, go ahead and take a moment to search it on YouTube. I'll wait. Now, did that horrible sound actually help my condition? Well, I don't know, because I couldn't listen to the noise long enough to find out. My point being, if this is the most annoying sound that I have personally heard, then a creature with hypersensitive hearing should be affected by it on a far greater level. I turned the lock screen off my cell phone to have the frequency ready at a moment's notice and started off on this odyssey in a slow jog. As my steady advancing form cut through the exceptionally thick fog-like, a small plane departing the clouds, the voice in my head spoke again, warning me of impeding dangers, as the hairs on the back of my neck stood up with a noticeable electric charge. It sees you now, little one. Be careful, the voice said, as I forced myself not to look around nervously, not wanting the entity to know that I was already aware of its presence. After half a mile of jogging at a slow but steady pace, the first telltale signs of trouble wafted its way into my nose with its sticky sweet rot, forcing me to breathe through my mouth to avoid the repugnant stench as I began closing in on the one-mile mark of my run, the voice spoke once again, louder and more grounded with my conscious mind now, making my spine tingle with the very presence of its words. When you reach the throne, it will make its move, the voice warned me, referring to the tree stump that someone had carved into a rudimentary child-sized throne that sat next to a bench facing the river. The aforementioned landmark was only about 400 yards away, making me slow my pace and gently touch the pistol holstered on my right hip. 
underneath the green raincoat. I began to slowly trace my fingers across the gun's barrel so my reflexes would be ready to act at a moment's notice. It was time. She is more aware of the reality of what lurks within these woods than I ever imagined, and she has become mindful of my true nature as well. I doubt it, for whatever I am, both angel and demon alike have considerable vexation when attempting to locate or control me, <laughs> a trait that has proved to be very useful in retaining my privacy and clandestine lifestyle. I watch her close in on the one-mile marker of her run with a nervous concern as I circle my fingers around the silver amulet, knowing that her Potential psychic abilities have turned this lawless premonition into a haphazard free-for-all, affecting everyone and everything involved. A familiar yet alarming scent forces me to release my amulet, to begin scanning the immediate area with my heightened senses. No, not now, I think to myself, as a man in his late fifties clad in full tactical gear, begins to inch out of the forest with what appears to be some kind of automatic rifle, parallel to the girl's position. It's the pawn shop employee, with Gaius mere moments away from unfolding everywhere. I simply do not have the time or focus to try and read the man's present intentions. All I know is that he is here to kill, rather be the girl or... It's too late. She's about to reach the small throne-looking tree stump. I have to act now. So quoth this raven. There is a part two. I hope to get it out this week. Um, I apologize for my noisy animals. They are all wanting to cuddle because there's a terrible snowstorm outside, so... I hope they weren't too disturbing. And I hope you all have a lovely day, darlings. Bye-bye. Thank you for stopping by, my darlings. It means so much. I so enjoy telling these stories for you. And here are some of my marvelous supporters. Please, if you haven't subscribed, consider doing so. If you give this video a like, it would help me out ever so much. Thank you, and have a lovely, lovely day.